Okay. <clears throat> um, thank you for joining us uh, for this discussion on uh, online art. This program is sponsored by the Stanford Deans of uh, Engineering, Humanities and Sciences, uh, Medicine, and Continuing Studies. Uh, this program replaces the Bay Area Laser Program, Leonardo Art Science, even around the world. Um, this program of dialogues, uh, I call them the last dialogues, where last stands for life, art, science, technology, uh, because in a sense, they also replace the sixth last festival that we wanted to organize in April. <clears throat> and of course, we couldn't. <clears throat> uh, what is the last festival? Go to uh, www.lastfestival.org and you'll see how it works. Uh, if you missed the previous last dialogues, uh, you can find the videos at lasertalks.com. Uh, the next dialogues will be <clears throat> with scientists with, uh, in July, with uh, Luis Villarreal on the uh, virus sphere. And the role of viruses may play in the origin and evolution of life, which I find a very interesting topic. And then Bruno Olshausen, on uh, new developments in uh, neuroscience. <clears throat> so anyway, check out uh, lasertalks.com for the program. Uh, this is the third evening about online art, and maybe there will be more. I, I heard a lot of questions, very few answers, honestly, so far. <clears throat> um, coming to tonight's program, our panelists, very brief introduction. When you registered for this uh, event, you saw their long bios. Um, uh, Jabao Li is a media artist who graduated from Harvard School of Design uh, in Design and Technology and, and from National University of Singapore um, in Electrical Engineering. Uh, she's a prototyping designer at, at Apple. <coughs> I never met Jabao in person because she was scheduled for a laser that was canceled. So, sorry, this is the replacement. Okay, Not as excited as, as being on campus. Um, Alex Reben. <coughs> is an inventor and uh, artist who graduated from the MIT Media. I have known Alex since, uh, I don't know, 2012, 13, when his robots realized uh, Robots in Residence, uh, the first documentary ever shot and directed by robots. Um, and then through his residency at Stochastic Labs in uh, uh, Berkeley. Um, Alex has exhibited at the last festival that I mentioned and spoken previously at Lasers. <clears throat> so his work has uh, definitely caught my attention several times. Uh, Craig Hobbs, a graduate of UC. Craig, you have a very interesting background. Uh, Craig Hogg, a graduate of UC Santa Cruz, is currently Associate Professor of Digital Media Art at San Jose State University in San Jose where he's also the director of the Cadre Laboratory, which I don't remember the acronym, but is one of the leading institutions for uh, art. And I think the second oldest in the country or something like that. Uh, this year, students had to exhibit their work online uh, via a networked uh, um, a virtual gallery. And Craig helped me uh, stage the third uh, last festival that was held in uh, San Jose. Uh, E2 was scheduled for a laser talk and uh, <clears throat> he was also a victim of this virus, so that's our replacement. <laughs> okay, I'm smiling, I'm smiling, Craig. Uh, okay, so each, each of them will give us a 15 minute uh, introduction to their work uh, and uh, <clears throat> hopefully with a focus on online. Um, and uh, with creative ideas, I'm sure. And we start with Jabao. Uh, you can uh, uh, share your screen if you want. Mine should be uns unscreened. Unmute yourself, please. Um, Unmute yourself. Okay, can you hear me? <laughs> um. Go all about. It's all yours. Okay. Okay. Um, let me just check everything. It's fine here. Uh, okay. Video clip. Um, so, um, as 
Pierre already introduced that I kind of work in, in, the, set, in the intersection between uh, technology, design, and art. Um, and But this time, I'll mainly focus talking about the several art projects I've been done uh, focusing on, on online and around COVID. Um, so the first one is um, Toast and Dance. So with COVID-19 outbreak, many social political issues are becoming even more apparent. Like one of them is this dodging of responsibilities and shifting blames of go government officials. And it reflects the problem of our current social political mechanism and has been one of the causes of this uh, coronavirus web spread. Um, so there are two words. Um, one is toss pan, shui guo in Chinese, it means um, dodge responsibility and shift the blame to someone else. The other is carry a pen, uh, it means take the blame for the thoughts of others. So um, at the beginning of this, we've seen this tossing pen behavior between central government to local government, between US, China, all over. So I wonder how can I criticize this phenomenon in a sarcastic yet humorous way and hopefully to get it widespread to, gener more, to generate more discussion um, and to remind people not to lose focus or attention because of this toss time behaviors. Uh, so I chose dance as a medium and made this dance. <laughs> of this dance uh, is by typing the number three document um, and map the A, B, C, D, E, F, G on keyboard to the do, re, mi, fa, so, la, si on piano keyboard. So uh, by typing this document, um, then I make the music. And the gist of this document is about without approval, no institution or individual may publish information about the results of pathogen testing or experiments around this virus. And to some extent, uh, the document legitimated a lot of toast pan behavior at the beginning of this outbreak. So the logic is that you listen to the music of this document and then dance the toast pan dance. And then um, the virus come to um, kind of sp spread across the world. And um, I made a um, Trump version that um, in response to various behaviors of his. This dance become viral on Chinese internet. Um, and also since we are quarantined and social distancing at, at home, this dance becomes a perfect exercise because you can just easily grab a pen in the kitchen um, to exercise. And at the same time, 
uh, bring this topic into discussion. So uh, this is a compilation of various people dancing at home. Throwing. There's a walk throwing gymnastic aerobics exercise video that went viral. But tell us, Huang, you're also doing dances on TikTok, right? So oh. that was uh, Hong Hong uh, explaining what toast pan means uh, in her TED talk and talk about this dance. Um, so that that's the first one, and the second one, the sentiment is moves are very different. Um, this is about, um, so it's called Unfinished Farewell. It's a um, website. Um, so as COVID-19 spreads across the globe and this number of deaths continues to be up updated, um, the people we've lost and the heartbreaking experience they have had have been uh, replaced by the collective mourning. Um, it's like the death of one man is a tragedy, but the death of a million it becomes a statistic. So we built this online platform trying to document as many people uh, who have less left us because of this pandemic as possible. Um, and we also include uh, the help seeking information people posted before they pass away, uh, which is the evidence they left to this era. Um, so help to um, provide the space for the family members to release their grief and for the public to mourn, because behind every number is a life. So this is a video document the website. to the chat, uh, it's called um, farewell.care. Uh, you can go to the website to see more of it. Um, and the many people we recorded here are outside of the statistic, like people who have waited to die because of unconfirmed testing, those whose death certificates were being tempered, those who committed suicide out of despair, and those um, non-COVID patients whose medical treatment was squeezed. Um, and also uh, the doctors and nurses, the frontline workers who have lost their life due to, due to infection or overwork. Um, and I designed it in the way that um, visitors enter the space, they can sense that sort of atmosphere, the, the sorrow, grief, solemn, agony, and it's a comparable feeling that visitors can have as if they physically visiting their town. Um, I think, it gives us the way um, a much more understanding of death 
than the increasing statistics. So um, in each chamber, so um, in the main screen, you can see this uh, person and their information. And then when you enter to, uh, when you click on farewell, you can see their help seeking posts. Um, and you can uh, send your message to, the, to them. So after publishing this project, we received many of these touching messages. Uh, I didn't translate it here because I feel a lot of subtle feeling in a language may lose in translation. Um, I'll just say some of it. Um, for example, do I need to shout out loudly to be noticed? The best memory of the deceased is um, not to lose memory in your future, life, in your lifetime. And RIP, I hope you can change your job if you become police again. This is to a police, um, a cyber police that um, was uh, passed away because of overworking, because he was censoring the, the website at that time. Uh, can I understand, don't understand. Because of your existence, I will always learn to love humankind. Um, no matter how many words are pale, I'm sad that it's this is more like a tragedy than a heroic, heroic story. No freedom to speak, no freedom to die. Um, I hope I can at least know your name, not just an, the unknown name. May you rest in peace. Um, and the next one is, um, I sort of shaved my head, made a mask out of female hair in response to um, this, uh, female medics in China, this appears in Gansu Daily, that um, they try to pro, um, use female body to pro do as a propaganda, like all oh, these nurses shave their ha head uh, before they go to the front line. Um, it's like, how, how, how can such an act of violating women's body be used to promote merits and achievements? Um, so that was my response to this. Um, and um, another one is uh, onejaw.world. Um, I also send the link to, um, to our chat. Uh, I can pull this out. It's, um, it's a website that's uh, trying to connect people around the world uh, sort of drawing. So if you go there, um, I, I just finished this. Um, those already they are, are from another seminar that was in Japan, so you can feel it's very uh, different style. Uh, so you can click on draw and move it, move the canvas location uh, to a place that you can draw um, and then draw on it. Um, and then after you draw, yeah, after you draw, you can, um, or when you see other people's, you can replay what they draw and share. And for each of your share, um, the, the canvas will ex expand. Um, yeah, so this is about uh, like during this COVID, instead of nationalism and isolation, um, like we should face COVID more as a human, um, as a whole, instead of the walls. Um, and this is a Finnish farewell that I just showed. Um, there's the sound of it. Um. time. Um, I'll just talk about this then. Um, it's an uh, online space that was on during uh, Qingming Festival, which is the uh, tomb sweeping festival in China. Um, so here we take um, people, the visitors, to the front of Hongshan Auditorium in Wuhan and uh, walk counterclockwise in front of the auditorium. Um, the auditorium is where the two sessions happened, um, and it was kind of an um, uh, um, important time during the, the, the first outbreak during, uh, of COVID. Um, so uh, this is the video of it.
Festival, uh, people can't physically be there to commemorate the dead. Um, so this is the space first to commemorate. Second, there's also resistance here um, because it's in front of the Hongshan Auditorium and it's counterclockwise, counterclockwise walking. Um, and this statue um, will um, stand permanently stand in front of the auditorium on major map websites. Very good. Um, yeah, um, and I won't talk about this. Um, you can find more information about this headsets, um, helmets on my website, and I also did a TED talk around it. So, welcome to um, look at it. That's it for me. Okay, thank you. Very nice, Alex. Okay. Okay, so go in here. Okay, perfect. I'm mute myself. Okie dokie. Hi everyone. Um so today, oops, change the uh see so if I can change the screen here. There we go. Okay. I think that's showing okay. Um, so today I'm going to talk about uh, a new series that I'm putting out of, uh, of network, um, net artwork. Uh, I've been calling Chow, Code In, Art Out. Um, and uh, the, one, the one sentence tagline for this is it's a, a set of self-contained digital artworks are, that are rendered in a standard web browser. Um, so I'm going to quickly change over to uh, Chrome here. Um, this is a live demo, which always can be tricky. Um, so the self-contained idea is that you can copy the code for the artwork, paste it into a web browser address bar and press enter and get that complete artwork. Um, and this is not hosted online anywhere. All the code needed to render uh, this particular artwork was in that cut and paste that I just did. Um, so here's another example. Again, quite different. That one's based on Conway. I'll also put these in the chat uh, towards the end of the presentation. Kind of a wandering one. Um, and this last one is a, a static image um, of an artwork. Uh, the other interesting thing you can do is right click and save this image and you get a full 600 DPI uh, rendering of the original artwork that you could or could not uh, print on your own, which raises some interesting questions. Um, so going back to here, doo -doo -doo. um, 
So uh, yeah, um, I'll read I'll read my statement about this. It might be a bit helpful. Uh, so high level computer code as rep representational language of mathematical logic from which seemingly infinite complexity can arise, stemming from the most basic logic of one and zero on and off, true and false. Code's purpose is to abstract fundamental digital operations into a human readable and understandable form by leveraging the conventions of language and mathematics. The complexity which arises out of simple rules weaved together creates beauty from this conceptual yet constrained instruction set. Um, much as how nature makes grand structures from numerous discrete units. So this, uh, this particular series arose out of a few ideas I had been looking at. Um, so this work from 2017 uh, are two oil paintings, and on the left is the um, web page code for the image that it produces on the right. Um, and this was all uh, rendered by hand in oil paint, um, sort of switching mediums, which I, which I found quite interesting. Um, I also made a website called uh, 4QR.xyz that was picked up by a couple sort of hack blogs. Uh, the idea here uh, was similar that you could go to 4QR.xyz, uh, make a web page, and host the entirety of that web page in this sort of link um, so that the web page isn't actually hosted anywhere. All the information to make uh, a web page is contained uh, within the link itself. Um, I also did a few works using uh, crypto. Um, so these were uh, custom tokens I made on the Ethereum blockchain called Token Art. Um, so you could own one of these tokens. I gave them out at a gray area festival a few years ago. Um, and inside these envelopes were the private keys to own these tokens. Uh, but in themselves, these tokens aren't artworks. They're just the keys to produce artworks. But the interesting thing is that they can produce multiple different types of artworks. So here's one particular output uh, when you would scan these badges so that it would create a poem, which is unique to your token. It could create a sticker unique to your token. Um, or another example, uh, you go up and scan the work and it would create a large scale projection based on your token in real time. Um, and you could own and trade these tokens, but the actual artworks that the tokens made were not in themselves portable. Um, they needed to be rated every time. Um, also been interested in things like uh, uh, augmented reality. These are a bunch of uh, AI generated faces on a postcard that I give out. Um, of fun seeing them uh, attached to physical objects. Um, so that all came to, all these ideas sort of came together, I guess. I've been working on this particular concept maybe since 2016, but now during the pandemic, it seemed um, more than ever, it'd be interesting to do something that you could share in a non-centralized way and use the internet, not just as a medium to like put up pictures of artwork, but use the actual uh, uh, engines of web browsers themselves as the as the medium so over 50 percent 53 percent of the world's population has access to a web browser um, which makes a web browser the uh, most ubiquitous way to render digital art uh, versus any sort of um, other output uh, also if you make code that's compliant with web browsers you have a pretty good chance that it's going to be archival in the future um, because web browsers have to be quite backward compatible uh, unlike, say, doing digital art on a Betamax tape <laughs> or something in the past where the medium can become expired, uh, it'd be very rare for uh, the artwork I'm doing here um, to not be renderable in the future uh, because it's so standardized, and I'll get a bit into the code later. Um, so this all works around a concept that m not many people know about called a data UR URI, um, and this works in all web browsers except for the ones put out by Microsoft naturally. Um, so the idea here is that if you put in this text data slash HTML, everything after it will be treated by the web browser as valid HTML and JavaScript code. Uh, so what this means is you can basically embed an entire web page in that uh, cut and paste code that I showed before. Um, and you can see the example below here where uh, data text HTML just makes a little hello world uh, in a heading. Uh, you can type this into a browser yourself and, and give it a try. Um, so uh, yeah, my idea was to uh, combine the output of the code, the sort of aesthetic object with the code itself. Um, and as far as I know, in the research that I've done, I haven't seen any other artwork which has actually included the code which produces it in itself, which to me is kind of an interesting recursive uh, addition. 
Um, the QR code uh, included with the artworks um, uh, basically encapsulates all the text that you would need to paste into a web browser. It just makes it easier for you to scan it with your phone, copy it, and uh, render it yourself. There's a bit bit of a close up. Um, you can see how the sort of two two objects are contained within each other. Um, so I gave myself a series of constraints as one does. Um, so uh, in in this artwork, all these things are true. Uh, so it uses what's called vanilla JavaScript, and JavaScript's the language uh, that's used within web browsers to make uh, these programs. Uh, and it does it doesn't rely on any external co uh, code which is not included with web browsers. And it does not actually require internet access. So you could completely go offline and paste this code into a browser and it would still work. It only uses US keyboard characters. That way you could uh, copy it by hand if you needed to um, from uh, say something that's on a wall. Uh, it fits within the constraints of a QR code, uh, which mostly means that it has a certain length limit. It runs in the top two most used web browsers at the time. Uh, I think right now that's uh, Chrome and Safari. Um, it's a W3C valid code. W3C is the standard organization. So basically this just means is the code that I make has to not have any errors. Uh, it runs by pasting into an address bar. Uh, and for any output which differs between web browsers and operating systems, I render it on the most used browser. Um, so as you saw uh, in that example of a print, um, the archival medium I'm using is paper and ink. Um, but you also could copy that code and share it or store it digitally. Um, so uh, there are several ways to actually render the uh, artwork from the code. One is you copy it with your eyes. So you just take a picture of the artwork, look at the code and retype it and, and paste it into a dress bar. You could save it as an HTM file. Uh, that also works. Um, so you could just put it in the text editor uh, and, and save .htm. Uh, you can scan a QR code with the app and paste that result in output. And again, you can scan the QR code um, as an HTM file. There are some non-archival ways that I have going right now that makes it easier to use. So I have a website, qr2a.xyz, which I'll show in a little bit. And that automatically renders the artwork. Uh, and there's also a hash URL link that basically is a way to share a link that immediately also renders that artwork. Um, so there's several ways to put it out there. Um, and yeah, right now on QR2A, I have a QR code scanner uh, and, a hash co and a hash code forwarder. Um, this uh, hash address here is that, uh, that hello world example uh, put as uh, a link and I'll also have a gallery on there. Um, so here's an example of uh, a printout. So um, yeah, it's just a QR code scanning app. You copy the code. Uh, again, this is being done on mobile. Uh, you paste it into your address bar and just hit go and it's working. Uh, and again, this will render the artwork whether or not you're connected to the internet. Uh, so it doesn't actually rely on any ex external connectivity. Um, so getting into the code, uh, here's the uh, code for that um, example that you just saw. There seems to be a lot to it, but I'll quickly go through uh, all of it. I think it's you know easy enough for people to understand if you go line by line. The, the actual code that makes the particular artwork is this highlighted uh, bit. Uh, the rest of this code is sort of housekeeping to align things and set sizes and have helper functions and that sort of thing. Um, so the first line we get again is that data text HTML that basically tells the browser that what's about to follow is HTML and JavaScript type code. Uh, then you have doc type HTML, which is required by the W3C standard that again tells the browser that what you're about to see is a document of type HTML. Um, and then there's this little funny bit, which is sort of unique to me. The first five characters are a unique uh, identifier that I have for every edition of all artworks that I make, digital or not. Um, and the remainder is a bcrypt hash uh, using a password that I only know. Um, and in this way, no other artist can make uh, artwork, which um, they could pass off as mine without actually having my password. So this is a way for me to authenticate uh, both digital and physical artworks. Um, there's a title. Uh, in this case, it was called Bad Scrubber. Uh, and this is generated from that art ID number. So every um, artwork has a generative title. This is uh, a bit of style code telling the browser to set everything centered and make it the full screen and have a black background and that sort of thing. Um, and then we start with uh, telling the browser we want to draw on the browser screen. So we set up something called a canvas. Um, 
this is uh, the seed number. So this is a number that actually defines the output of the artwork. So each artwork has a unique seed number, which is deterministic of its output. So if you were to change this number by one digit, you would get a completely different output than the others. Um, so this is the actual number that defines what this artwork is. Um, this sets it to uh, a width and height size in pixels. Uh, this gets a, a context from that canvas. Uh, this is kind of an important bit. It looks kind of complicated. It's what's called a pseudo random number generator. Uh, and basically it takes that seed number and generates a whole bunch of numbers that appear random from that number. Uh, but since it's something called deterministic, it will always be the same random numbers every time, which is why that seed number defines uh, the aesthetic output of that artwork. Um, and here's where the actual code for making the art comes into play. This is an example of just making a red rectangle that uh, starts at zero, zero position and is width by width size. This is an example of a, of a rectangle. And then it ends with an end script tag. Um, that's pretty much it to the code. Um, getting into what makes it interesting is, like I said before, creating complexity out of simple uh, algorithms and input. So here's a square with uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight points um, labeled A through H. And uh, you can connect these points with lines in these 10 ways. Uh, so you get these 10 varieties of things. Um, you can take any of these uh, uh, tiles and rotate them each by 90 degrees, so then you get four different outputs. Uh, so if you coded that up, you could programmatically make very complex looking output from those very simple rules. Um, and this is how the code gets built up from these simple ideas to complexity. Here's what the colors, then you can do things that are like black and white. Um, then of course, uh, I can get fancier. So I started going down a rabbit hole with these, uh, what they're called truche, I believe, uh, curves. Um, a few different, uh, whoops, varieties of, of output. This one's quite colorful. Sort of more black and white. The animated ones I quite like, they're quite glitchy. Um, oops. Um, and then you get into, uh, yeah, all sorts of weird and complicated things. Again, these follow the same rules, but I'm just sort of playing with the way that the rules are interpreted um, by the system. And you see a bit of a bit of an animation here. Um, so I'll quickly go through a whole bunch of other examples of types of prints and outputs that I've been making. Um, I'll put a link at the end of the presentation or you can check out a whole bunch more on uh, my Instagram and other pages. Um, here's an example of what a print would look like from this particular uh, output. Again, you see the tree on top and the code and output on the bottom. And then the same tree code, but um, sort of mashed up with colors and, and different parameters creates these quite wild outputs, um, sort of space invadery type code. Uh, and here's a couple more examples. When the, when the code makes animations for the prints, I put uh, frames at different time intervals. So there's a grid of frames because you can't really capture statically what an animation is uh, on a piece of paper. Um, so here are a few examples of those. Um, and again, a few more sort of outputs that I'll go quickly through. Sort of fun jiggly Neko wafer animations and sort of fun uh, Starscape type ones. Um, yeah, so uh, quickly uh, to sort of wrap things up, there are other, besides prints, there are other fun things to do. Um, so this is a, uh, a receipt printer with a big red button. Every time you press the button, you get a unique artwork that you can take home and uh, scan yourself or render. Uh, and this is sort of playing with the, um, the idea of the art object being precious. Here it's a quite disposable piece of receipt paper um, that creates a very uh, complex output. And again, this all works with that sort of cut and paste uh, mechanism. And uh, if you were to say collect the receipt printer itself as an art object, you can create uh, nearly infinite artworks from, from that object. So it really questions what um, the artwork is in this case. Is it the receipt that's coming out or is it the system that prints those receipts? Um, and yeah, given my background, I obviously can help uh, sort of adding robotics into it. It's sort of a pen plotter doing one of these curve outputs. Um, I have a, a, a video on my Instagram if you want to watch the full thing, but uh, this, is the, this is the output using a calligraphy pen, which is quite beautiful. Um, and here's an, uh, an example of uh, a song that's encoded in uh, a QR code. In, in output. Um, so the synthesizer, the visualizations, and the entirety of the information needed to make this piece of music is encoded within that QR code and that text. 
obviously it's a simple song, but uh, a song nonetheless. Um, okay, I think that's, oops, that's, uh, that's my time. Um, I'll paste a couple examples of those cut and paste things in the chat. Uh, it's not really public right now, but if you want to play with some online, you can go to qr2a.xyz slash gallery. My Instagram and uh, Twitter is that at Art Poffin. Uh, and these will be uh, premiering at a sh online show at the Kate Vass Gallery uh, in early July. So you can check it, uh, check these out there. Uh, thank you. Excellent. Enter, enter all of these in the chat, please. Greg? Yes. <clears throat> Greg? Yeah, I'm here. Okay, all yours. Okay, let me uh, share a screen here. Okay, I'll mute myself. Okay, so um, my talk here today is called The Second Wave, uh, Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome, Coronavirus 2. Um, really thinking about the virus uh, versus the disease. Um, I am a associate professor of digital media art at San Jose State University and direct the Cadre Media Lab. Um, given the current situation in terms of political upheaval, economic turmoil, widespread protests in America, and the global pandemic, um, I'll be leaving behind an academic approach today, no net art, no AI, just a tiny bit of cybernetics. And it is interactive. Um, I'll post the links via chat as we, uh, we step through it. So uh, one of the thoughts uh, I had at the beginning of the Bay Area shelter in place uh, was, th was this idea that isolation uh, reifies virtualization. Um, and really that sense of isolation that came from myself and my students as we I left the university in late February and found our places at home to begin uh, to conduct our curriculum remotely uh, via Zoom. And I, I found that there was this inverse correlation between the growth of the cloud and the growth of COVID-19. And um, you, you can see that in the stock market uh, as, as it is, but um, really thinking about the phenomenological experience of that for both myself and the students and ideas around community and uh, society and the public. Um, I'm going to focus here today on some specific artwork in a, a specific group of students, um, but this is uh, generally what I've been thinking about. Um, it started out as a typical Silicon Valley uh, response to uh, what was a very articulate order by our governor um, for us to, to be the first state to lock down. And uh, as expected, um, we had to somehow come out with uh, a way to think of uh, some positives in this scenario. Uh, given we'd been reading Norbert Weiner in uh, my seminar class, I thought this quote was appropriate in a very real sense. We are shipwrecked passengers on a doomed planet. Yet even in a shipwreck, human decencies and human values do not necessarily vanish. Thus the theory of entropy and the considerations of the ultimate heat death of the universe did not have such profoundly depressing moral consequences as they seem to have at first glance. And at first glance, they are de depressing and uh, profoundly immoral consequences. Um, but uh, really by focusing on my students and on my job as a professor, I was able to turn that around a bit. Um, of course, the typical Silicon Valley utopian response is Zoom parties. So my first Zoom was a party, a Piscean birthday party with some friends uh, from around the country. And um, that, was, that was sort of the turn that began uh, my embrace of Zoom. Of course, we also had the obligatory faculty meetings. One interesting fact of, of being online was the trimming of the administrative fat in the university, um, but it wasn't without its uh, committee meetings. Um, interestingly, these were meetings with much consternation, uh, a lot of the unknown, and um, not a clear understanding of what the future held. Uh, we were getting a lot of readings like this one, uh, by Rebecca Barrett Fox. Please do a bad job of putting your courses online. Uh, I found this to be an interesting response. Um, I also found the, the, the anecdotal uh, evidence from my students to be even more interesting. They had dreamed of, of a world of virtualization, of, of not having to attend class in the classroom. And it was interesting to see uh, once that space was gone, uh, how much they longed for it. Uh, but I did have uh, excellent attendance uh, via Zoom and um, we were about 95% attendance rates. So my focus today really is on our response as students and factory, the challenges of COVID-19, not the Brady Bunch response, which uh, Zoom inspires. So I'm gonna um, move on to that now. Um, I come from the Cadre uh, Laboratory for New Media. I know Joel Slayton gave a talk last night. We've been around for over 30 years and we're the second media lab after MIT. 
Um, you can find more about Cadre on our website. Um, right, let me get the chat up so I can share my chats quickly here. Um, and essentially, uh, Cadre stands for Computers and Art Design Research and Education. And we are a multidisciplinary lab that has been around uh, since the 80s to, to create digital media art. Um, as a byproduct of solving problems in the, in the lab, we're often iterating on uh, local problems that we face uh, for our students with our equipment um, in the world. And we really are focused on peer-to-peer -peer learning. Um, and we, we try, try to create an environment that is intrinsically motivating through that peer-to-peer -peer model. And, and that was an opportunity that, that came up immediately once we were no longer in person, the question being, how would our uh, Bachelor of Fine Art exhibition occur? We have a culminating exhibition for our, our BFA students and our MFA students. We have around 270 BFA students uh, now in the Cadre Media Lab, up about 25% per year since 2012 uh, when I arrived. And so we had a cohort of about 35 students uh, with the prospect of no, uh, no exhibition. So um, as we do, we bootstrapped and we worked with one of our graduate students, Don Hansen, to construct a system to solve this problem. Uh, the system that we built um, was, was really one that um, uh, Don had already developed and was underway with, had had his first exhibition. Um, and the, the challenge we faced with our students was, was converting this idea of a two-dimensional space into a virtual environment where our students could exhibit their work. This is actually the layout of the space uh, from the last festival uh, that I did with Piero uh, at the Hammer Theater Center in downtown San Jose. And this was the, the floor plan that we were, we were just about to use to lay out our, our student exhibition. So our turn uh, was here. And I'm gonna go ahead and share these links as we go through them. So you're welcome to explore these links on your own. Um, our exhibition uh, was called, is called Pivot Point, um, the SJSG DMA BFA exhibition class of 2020. Uh, its inception date was May 22nd, uh, 5 p.m., uh, official inception date, and its closing date is, well, never. Um, interestingly, this kind of exhibition doesn't ever have to close. Uh, the brief is Pivot Point is a collection uh, of virtual installations created by the graduating BFA class in digital media art at SJSU in the spring of 2020. Hosted solely online via a networked online gallery, a network virtual gallery, the exhibition pushes into new ways of experiencing art in an online setting. In the midst of a global pandemic, each artist confronted the challenge of transitioning their work from a traditional physical installation into the evolving digital realm. So uh, what I'd like to do now is just go right into it. So uh, I'm gonna, take you into the exhibition, and you too are invited to visit the exhibition. I've posted the link there, uh, hosted at newart.city, which I'll talk about here in just a moment. Um, and I'm gonna jump in there right now. So interestingly, uh, oops, wrong link. Tonight, um, New Art City is also hosting uh, the Gray Area Foundation uh, uh, exhibition. There's an exhibition going on there with Gray Area Foundation. So what you'll find when you when you log into our gallery um, is that there's probably other gallery goers uh, uh, currently coming in from the Gray Area exhibition. So there are multiple galleries in New Art City um, and this is ours. So um, does everyone see the, uh, the image here? Yeah? Looking for a thumbs up maybe? Yeah, okay. So let me uh, exit real quick out of it. Um, I want to point out uh, just basic documentation. You can click anywhere to enter the gallery. You moved using the WASD keys or your arrow keys. You can jump with the space bar, you use your mouse to look around, escape to leave or join or to recover your cursor. And uh, you can go right into the quick chat to chat if you'd like. So I'm just gonna click back in there. So uh, here it is. Um, these are the students that we exhibited. Um, I'm not going to read all their names, but every one of them uh, uh, contributed significantly to this project. Um, and then here's how, how our galleries are sorted out. Uh, we're in the main gallery now, and there are eight galleries and a ninth hidden gallery that we, we created. So let's, let's just go into one of these galleries. Um, pop up my notes here. So essentially, this is a multiplayer virtual exhibition space built in WebGL. And let's go, let's just go over here. 
Um, oh, I should point out why we're here. Uh, any, any triangle you see is another visitor. So many of these are, are here from the gray area showcase, but if you've logged into the gallery, uh, you too will be here. So let's, uh, let's go to gallery one. And as a result, you may see a little bit of slowdown occurring. Um, often forget, so I have to go look at the wall placard where things are located. Um, yeah, so we'll go right in here to gallery one. So these little cubes, um, uh, one of the interesting things about the development of the gallery is when, when we first started, uh, when Don first presented uh, the gallery to us, it was a research practice project that he was doing uh, as part of his, his MFA uh, uh, work at, at uh, San Jose State, but it missed a few features. Uh, the portal jump feature, which we're about to, to make right here, and then uh, spatialized audio. So um, those feature requests ended up uh, being created for our exhibition. So you can just uh, hit one of those portal jumps and you'll go into that gallery. So we're gonna walk into gallery one. And here we are. So the students uh, were able to position and present their work inside of these spaces to varying degrees. Um, and this is a still from a video game called Magenta. Uh, and this piece can be explored by using the portal jump to jump to the Magenta World demo. Uh, so we, were, we, we provided the possibility for students to portal jump out of the exhibition into their own websites so one could pass right through the gallery into their work itself. Um, let's uh, Craig, uh, sorry to interrupt. You may want to optimize for video so it's smooth. Uh, it, click on wheel options and there's sorry, say there's, where? Uh, wheel options and then optimize for video. In Chrome? Uh, no, in Zoom. Okay, uh, let me see real quick if I can get there. Are you having trouble seeing the clips? It's very, it's like a uh, stop motion. Okay, let's see if I can get that uh, taken care of here. There is a little bit of a challenge of it. Uh, zoom preferences? Uh, on the top, real options. Well, I'm on a Mac, I don't have an options. I have preferences. Uh, and uh, just looking for the specific um, feature you're suggesting to look at. So um, I'm not seeing optimize for video. You mean turn my video off? <laughs> uh, I, I guess if everybody is like... Um, okay, how about that? Is that better? I did uh, select op on screen share, I select optimize uh, for video. Oh. Can everyone see the, the exhibition now? Yeah, we can see that. It's just um, a bit chunky. It's yeah, like, so... Like, it's, it's, well, uh, it's, exactly, it's, fine. it's exactly the same, but I think it's fine with me. Yeah, yeah so my recommendation for the fully smooth experience is for, for you yourselves to enter into the gallery. Um, and you can do that while I'm talking, of course. Uh, so here's a piece by uh, Charlie Liu, Technology is Anthropology. And um, let me show you a couple by some of my students here. We've got uh, OBJ objects, so you can embed 3D objects into the space. Um, so video in here. This is a video uh, by Gabriel Fong, so. Hey Siri, play R&B on Spotify. I am ever present, yet I am invisible. Is it because of the way I talk? What if I changed my vocabulary to match yours? Fuck, what if I began to use profanities? Siri, give me directions to the nearest Starbucks. Turn right at the next light, you fucking idiot. Yeah, so, so Gabriel was really interested in scrutinizing you? Siri, uh, Siri's identity, form? and uh, I she created this amazing video that it, it finds its way as localized audio within gender, the gallery ethnicity. itself. It's, uh, back matter. to the main entrance. One, one of the uh, potential challenges right now within the system is that there is another event happening. So uh, the New Art City is not particularly scalable. Uh, uh, so we got a lot of people in there and we've, we've had some glitches with that before. 
So I think gallery four was one I want to show you, which is uh, over here. How many of you are in, in this uh, space? Some of you? Okay, great. Thanks, Wendy. Uh, that's really the, the way to experience it is to just kind of go there yourself. Um, I'm just going to develop gallery four for a second. And you'll see each gallery uh, loads the content for that gallery, which is a way for us to parse out uh, the data and, and the rendering of those spaces. Um, and here you can see another three-dimensional object um, that we're passing by here. Uh, we've got another video. This is by Jacqueline Ronaldo, who was uh, actually, that's not, that's Ian de Leon, that's not Jacqueline. Um, this is Jacqueline's work right here. Um, Aberration by Jacqueline uh, Regal Regalado, sorry. And yeah, so one gets sort of the experience of not only the other viewers, which in this case are somewhat blocking our view, uh, or we might be blocking theirs. And, you know, unlike a, a traditional museum, you can literally walk right through the work and then turn around and look at it. Uh, you can pretty much touch everything. Um, and, you know, I think the, the real way to see this work is to just go in there and explore it yourself. Um, I know I'm getting close here on time, but I want to just point out a couple things. So, uh, first and foremost, um, this system was built by a, a Don Hansen, one of our grad students, and I just want to make sure I, I credit Don uh, with the work. And Don is a local artist in the Bay Area who joined us this year, and you can find more at his website, uh, his recently updated website uh, right here, and that's uh, T-O-N-X-Y-Z. I'm going to paste that into chat. And then the system he's built is this uh, New York City, uh, which was developed um, uh, in really participation with the artists who, who were doing the work and exhibiting in the space. We were uh, officially the third exhibition. The first one, uh, as you can see, was Don's, and then he exhibited work by Kenny Myers, and then Pivot Point, our exhibition, was the third exhibition. And currently, right now, the Great Area Showcase Spring 2020 is opening right now. Uh, I think it ends officially at seven. So that's why you see all of the additional um, yeah, so uh, Suyash Joshi says, it's not escaping properly on Mac Safari for me. Um, so you want to hit escape twice. Uh, it does kind of take over um, uh, your, your browser. And so you, you really want to push and hold that escape button uh, to get out of it. And um, yeah, it is easy to get lost, Wendy. Uh, thanks for, for noting that. Um, you want to look for a portal to escape uh, to, back to the main gallery, if you can, if you're in gallery six. And then I'm going to show one more piece before I wrap it up. Um, and you can see right now just how many people are in the exhibition, which is amazing because if this was our, our, our BFA student exhibition, the exhibition would have literally lasted 48 hours in a physical space. And then it would have been gone basically forever uh, other than documentation. And so um, the fact that you know another opening is drawing uh, visitors to this opening, um, it's kind of a miracle, uh, really. Um, sometimes I just just go in and just uh, re-hit the root URL if I want to get myself back home um, to Pivot Point. You can always uh, revisit the origins of the show by just, just hitting the, the default URL. And then the last uh, space we'll go into is one uh, by Cole Meek. I believe this is Cole's show a piece in here. Cole, are you here? Nope, other side of the room. So I, I often have to go in and uh, to look at the map, look at the statement, um, find out where I am. Uh, this is Cole's Gallery 6. And this is a, a piece that Cole made in my, my video class, actually. And he wanted to take his video work and exhibit it in a dimension environment. <laughs> Wo landen diese Instrumente? Was wird daraus?
and uh, yeah, so that's that's pretty much it. Uh, I wanted to present the work uh, by our students and and what I had done to help facilitate that work. And so I'm going to wrap it up with that. Great. Great. Thank you, everybody. So I have a question for each of you, <clears throat> and then and then we we'll see if the audience has more. So let's start with um, Joe Bao. Um, so I'm, I'm curious about both the technology and the audience um, in uh, Asia and here. I, I know Singapore, you're definitely active in Singapore. You're active also in China. You also have an audience yeah. there. Yeah. Okay, so what do you notice in terms of tech platform? Are we, are we using the same platforms or are they different? And the audience, the reaction from the audience that you get, what, what difference you notice? Um, I feel the platform is quite similar. Um, <clears throat> no matter artists or um, like people looking at art. Um, and I guess there's a large, um, like the thing I built was on the website um, and there was large uh, audience uh, on mobile um, there. Um, yeah. Okay, Alex. Um, yeah, so so it's it's uh, of course uh, I've seen it before. It's it, it's really intriguing when you put the code becomes part of the artwork. It's like Michelangelo adding to the Sistine Chapel the instructions to paint the Sistine Chapel. <laughs> have you have you thought of adding also the audience, also the the reaction from the audience? How do you mean? I don't know. I mean, people see this thing; they could send you a feedback or they could say something and incorporate the audience. I mean, the next step, I mean, you have one step is the artwork itself. Another level is the process to build that artwork. Another level could be uh, how the audience perceives it. Yeah, so uh, when I've used uh, augmented reality platforms like Artivive, um, there, there are mechanisms to see how many people viewed the artwork, um, if people engaged with it, that sort of thing. Um, one of the key conceptual ideas behind uh, this new series of works is that it doesn't rely on being served anywhere online. So you don't have to have a server. If the internet goes down around the world, you can still run these artworks because all the information is contained uh, within itself. You just need a web browser even without the internet. Um, so <coughs> I would be hesitant to add some sort of feedback component because that would require some sort of server uh, in the background. Um, so far, I've been getting a lot of feedback through Twitter and Instagram. Uh, I've made some some of these codes that are so short that they actually fit within one tweet, and you can copy the artwork in the tweet and paste it on the top. Um, and I've gotten a lot of great reactions there. So I would say uh, the place where I've been getting a lot of feedback has been through social media. It's actually kind of a good platform for this, actually. Uh, Craig, a uh, question about <clears throat> interacting with millennials I mean, or, or uh, quasi-millennials. Most of your students are in their 20s, I assume. Yeah. Uh, I mean, they grew up playing multi-user uh, multi games and uh, social media and, and so on. Um, so, first of all, do you notice that they, they, when they do things online, they do them differently from the traditional net art? And second, how do they influence your own work? Yeah, so the students themselves are very comfortable in first-person viewpoint environments. I call it person-first environments, but um, they just, you know, they're, they're natives to that kind of perspectival space, even if it's distorted, if the camera angles are distorted. Um, you know, it was a very interesting dichotomy between their desire for a fully virtualized world and then the reality of not having that in-person experience. I mean, young students are, are still socializing, they're still developing in many ways. And, you know, our, the history of our lab really has a lot to do with that peer-to-peer -peer, uh, community. Uh, not in the internet sense, but in the person-to-person the, the -person sense. And we're very much a learning community in the Cadre Media Lab, and we're a little bit of the bad news bearers. You know, we take uh, come one, come all. We get people who uh, run from engineering, copy, or computer science, and, and want to make art or design or animation. And, so I think they really did miss that in-person experience. They, you know, they're, they long for the lost community. Um, one interesting thing is they show up, um, they definitely showed up more virtually than they did in person. And one of the interesting things for me as a professor is that you know, if a student's in class and distracted by an MMORPG or 
social media. It's a little bit nerve wracking for me. But if they at least show up in Zoom, I don't care what they're multitasking. If, if their name is there on the screen and they bother to show up in an environment where they're not required to be present, because we don't require attendance, they've at least decided they want to be part of that. So, I mean, you know, the generational differences are, are get more and more uh, vast as I age, but um, I'm also a bit of a digital native having grown up in the, in the 80s with, you know, 2400 bald bulletin boards and, you know, um, E-City and weird stuff like that. So um, I, I don't, you know, I think uh, really my goal there is to, is to, is to address our commonalities, um, respect our differences and to, to find where we can create a shared environment to, to um, sustain our community that was lost suddenly uh, in the lab. So I, I know you don't teach science. I'm just wondering if there's a difference in the, now that, that we move online, if there's a difference between the students that take a science class and the students that take an art class. Uh, the students that take the science class tend to be, <clears throat> I don't know if passive is the right word, but you know, they're just listening to the teacher. But the students that take your class are supposed to create something, and yeah. in this case, create something online. So uh, it would be interesting to compare the way these students react to being catapulted on the, on the online, uh, in the online world. Well, I, you know, these students, I worked with a lot of students in engineering and NCS, and I think they're all uh, facing that. The same thing we're all facing is really the crisis of the unknown and really watching sort of the, the world crumbling around them. While there is stability, we know that socially and politically things are very tenuous right now. And so I think it was a very emotional period, honestly, and, and getting this, you know, bootstrapping this exhibition space and, and doing something ourselves, you know, because we could have purchased some kind of off, off the shelf solution or use something that was already built. But building it together, even virtually and remotely, uh, made the most sense for us. And investing in our own, really, you know, um, investing in our own grads and our undergrads and, and having those, uh, really making those connections uh, real. I, you know, I can't speak for the sciences per se. But I know through the laser series and the interactions I've had and, and the funding, the funded projects I've done with engineering and computer science, even for this, the young scientists, the experience of engaging with other students who might be artists or designers is, is something that they really appreciated. Um, so a lot of that is lost now and um, it, it does concern me. <laughs> yeah, I, I, there's a lot of talk about uh, <clears throat> being creative in the way we teach. I just wonder if we, if we also need to have a discussion on, on, uh, on changing the way students, the students, there's also a new kind of creativity that can, that can come out from the people who, who learn, you know, become more participants in the process. But yeah, my, I'll just end it, that thought with mine really comes from Seymour Papert's constructionism. We're, we're really using uh, learning building uh, tools to model knowledge. Um, so that really hands-on experience, whether it's a uh, physical computing using Arduino or code, um, our students learn by making. And, and uh, a lot of that has been associated with doing something in person and failing in person. Um, so I do think that there's a lot of efficiencies gained by, by, by shutting down the system, <laughs> um, the university I'll say, uh, but um, there's a lot that's lost and, and it will be interesting to see what the future holds. Okay. You guys have questions for each other before I go into the QA for the audience? Yeah, I have a question for Craig. Um, so with your experience with uh, exhibiting artworks online, um, like how, how do you feel about this, uh, this space? Like why do you choose to have uh, something that looks like a real gallery? Um, when we are online in a totally new space, why not um, use some other formats? Um, and why you choose to have it uh, in a short period other than permanently? Um, yeah. And what are the like important aspects that you feel as the online exhibition should have? Yeah, so, um, you know, these were collective decisions. Um, all, all of our culminating exhibitions are collectively decided by students with faculty. We did work with the grad, with, with Don, and uh, this was the, the modality that he constructed it in, a traditional gallery space model. But it's certainly, uh, this, uh, the system he built doesn't 
doesn't preclude. You could essentially embed these works in any three-dimensional space. And I did suggest maybe you would want something less rectilinear. Um, my, my work myself, uh, particularly lately, uh, primarily has been uh, in India, uh, my own work. And I really didn't show any of my work today because it wasn't really appropriate for the topic. But um, in engaging in social praxis and, and, and doing a lot of travel throughout India, and, and some of my colleagues and friends from India, I think, are here today, but really had so much to do with that in-person experience, with, with uh, teaching in person, uh, creating in person, and then really doing live uh, public installations that must be experienced in person. So to be honest, you know, this is kind of an alien space for me to, to experience the traditional uh, ideas about art, which is creating community conversations, challenging the viewer. Um, and then we also have to just keep in mind that it's constrained by the mandates of nation state governments, the NSA, you know, we're, we're really all sort of filtered into that space of, of surveillance. And so um, we're really more vulnerable than ever. Um, and beyond Zoom security vulnerabilities, it's just that there's nothing that's not public anymore. And so I, you know, it, it's, it, it's, it's a really interesting, I think, somewhat schizophrenic experience of wanting to preserve the intimacy and privacy of students' experiences in the classroom, which are sometimes very politicized due to the nature of our students being from all over the world. And then the fact that now everything is online and being recorded and, and presented in that format. So I don't know the answer uh, to what it should look like, but I do think that um, much of what we're seeing is just an outpouring of creativity, whether from Zoom parties to um, you know, YouTube concerts. Um, I'm just seeing a lot of creativity and people using the internet for what it was built for uh, in this time. So I'm, I'm quite excited about this time, to be honest, uh, beyond the tragedy. Um, Alex, you want to get uh, Suya's question. Nice work. Have you considered using just CSS and HTML for art creation instead of JS? Uh, yeah, you could. Um, yeah, CSS has, <laughs> as of uh, as of late, definitely has become a programming language in its own. Um, originally, it was sort of more of a style uh, definition type language. Um, I think JavaScript has a lot more functionality than CSS right now. Um, I wouldn't preclude just using CSS in the future. I think that'd be quite interesting. Um, one reason it might be difficult for what I'm doing specifically is that pseudo random number generator, um, because I need deterministic numbers uh, every time, uh, JavaScript and CSS actually don't have a deterministic random number generator built in. Um, so if I could define that somehow in CSS, then uh, yeah, I should be able to port it over. Um, but right now JavaScript works pretty well for me. Okay, let's see. <clears throat> um, Craig, oh, Zhao Bao, are you afraid of the CCP when you make such provocative art? Have you had problems with censorship in China? Uh, of course, um, of course there's a concern. Uh, that's why we built all the server in US uh, um, and like try to uh, get away from the keyword searching censorship. And in fact, one of my collaborators about the unfinished farewell was ha like going to the police station to have a tea chat um, to force us to take the website down. Um, we put the original URL down, but moved to another URL. Um, and then after the two sessions, or and also the the 4th of June, which is usually the, the Tiananmen Square, protest at every year at that time. Um, it, we take it down and then afterwards now it's up again. Um, yeah, so even though there's a concern, but it's not a reason that I would stop making this kind okay. of thing. Um, <clears throat> a question for each of you. Um, what do you think is the future? So let's say a vaccine comes in January it's available widely in June and we go back to normal life uh, one year from now. Do you think one year from now we'll have forgotten everything about this online art, online exhibition and so on? Or will this trigger something that stays? 
I think one of the problems with uh, digital art and net art has been um, finding curators and cultural nexuses that understand it. Um, I guess I kind of liken it to what photography used to be. I mean, at some point, photography wasn't really taken as a serious art form. And now we have museums uh, that are dedicated to photography. Um, I think, you know, digital art also evolves really fast. It's not really a fixed medium. It's a multi, you know, it's a multi-medium thing. It's kind of hard to pin down. Um, I do think, you know, a lot of places knee-jerk reactions were just to make uh, photo galleries online of just images of other artwork, uh, where we have a real opportunity right now to, you know, leverage the internet for what it was made for, um, and really do things that are um, inherent to the the platform that it is. Um, I think certainly people are going to uh, there's going to be a lot more work from home. People are going to live much more digital lives even after the virus is gone. Uh, so I think uh, yeah, just the public is going to change in that way because businesses are going to change. Um, Jabal? I, I think there will be a large part of online presence too. Uh, for, for example, the Art Basel in Hong Kong this year moved to online and they will also continue to the online part every year later. Um, also, I feel uh, online art or online exhibition um, kind of, the very good thing is it's accessible to all. It's, um, it expands the audience really a lot. Uh, there's no physical location uh, limitation and no people have to buy tickets to do, go to art galleries. Um, so uh, like anybody can just see it for free. I think that's a very, very important part. Also, I think um, like just now I was asking Craig the question about online exhibition. I feel there are several points. One is accessible to all, uh, permanent, more interactive and uh, reinforce co-presence. That, that's what I feel about it, yeah. Craig? Yeah, um, you know, it's really hard to separate uh, art from politics today. Um, there was a great article in KQED on Artists Made Tools, uh, Resisting Algorithmic Racism and Empowering Communities. I, I think some of the changes we're seeing in the use of, of you know, one, one obvious change is, is the failure of um, the biometrics, uh, particularly facial recognition in the time of the mask. Um, you know, we, we really need to question, and we were, we were on the cusp of questioning some of the algorithmic, algorithmic biases that we're seeing. And I, I feel like this is, this is more than, than art today. And, and it's really about really reassessing where we're headed as societies. And um, this is a time of, of reckoning in many ways for the, the global society. And um, we all seem to be stranded on our own islands at this point, uh, depending on where we are in that nexus but um, I think the future uh, portends more connectivity for sure and more cultural understanding and, and, and more dissolution of the traditional nation state boundaries. And I think, again, there was the promise of the internet, uh, the stateless system that is now fully embe embellished with state. You know, um, there was an internet that we once loved that was stateless and, and now it is all about the state. So. I'd like to see um, really where the artists and the activists take, take these technologies. I, I can't really predict the future. I, I hope that it's not a disembodied future of virtual exhibitions and virtual galleries because ultimately in the end, we're staring at a two dimensional flat panel of glass. And I, I do long and I miss that uh, embodied human interaction of, of social praxis and performance and public art, of, of meeting artists and making connections through travel. Um, uh, but that's on hold now, and uh, yeah, that's that's a very um, <laughs> evasive way of saying that I think we don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't. I don't know. <laughs> okay, but and, I, I'm excited uh, by what I'm seeing. In fact, in fact, I feel I have more connection even than before. Like um, an artist in New York, they open up the space on Zoom um, virtually. Then we we have never met each other. We met a lot, like, uh, and have a lot of collaboration and communication, uh, comparing to before that we have to fly there physically meet each other. Um, okay. On this note, thank you very much. Thank you, panelists, and thank you, audience, for tuning in. Uh, the next lasers uh, will be in July, July seven, July eight. We'll go back to science with the uh, virosphere.
<clears throat> I'm, I'm really fascinated by, by, the, by these viruses now, uh, like everybody else, uh, I guess. And then uh, with the neuroscientist, uh, go to lasertalks.com for uh, details on the, on the program. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.